Well, I'm Dr. Bruce. I've been asked to come up here and talk about weight gain and aging. Well, we're going to talk about weight gain in particular. We'll do a little bit part about aging because, you know, when you're a doctor and you have to give a talk on a specific subject, you have to delve down. You really have to drill down and do a lot of research, right? So you know how doctors do their research? They get on Google, which is the same way everybody else does their research. And you know, I, I went on Google and I looked for weight gain and aging, you know, because it's not a topic that I typically talk about. I am a bariatric surgeon who also play, dabbles a little bit in wellness, okay, in terms of longevity, living a long, healthy life. How do people, because um, as I start ha helping people lose weight, um, it's hard to actually sit there and talk about bowel movements and things like that every day. I'd rather talk about, okay, so now you're feeling good. You lost your 30, 50, 60, 70 pounds. Now how do we fine tune that engine so we can have a long, healthy life, stay out of the hospital, stay out of the emergency room, stay out of your doctor's office? So, so anyhow, when I Googled this, I went through all this information. There really wasn't a whole lot of information. And of the information out there, some of it was conflicting and contradictory. You know, do this, don't do that. Have you ever seen, yeah, take this, and then you go to Uncle Joe, who says, who, by the way, is my, my greatest challenge, you know, uh, in terms of competition. It's either doctor or Uncle Joe. Well, you know what Uncle Joe says? You just take a couple of these licorice roots and do this, and you don't mind that hydrochlorothiazide. that. It's like, all right, I'm beat out by Uncle Joe again, right? So, you know, when you have all that conflicting information, coffee's good for you. Coffee's bad for you. Fish oil's good for you. Oh, fish oil causes prostate cancer. Well, I'm looking at this audience, and I'm thinking, none of you have to worry about that part. So you guys can <laughs> stick with the fish oil. So it, it becomes somewhat confusing. But what I do know is that over the past year, two, three years, four years, five years, since I've been involved in weight loss, and then since I've been involved in wellness, I know what works for our patients, even after surgery, because after surgery, they can flunk too. <coughs> flunk meaning that they didn't, pat, not necessarily didn't pass a test, but they can experience weight regain. And you know what's funny? Is when they come in initially to see me, for an initial appointment evaluation, as heavy as they are, I start changing their diets. I start testing their vitamin and mineral levels, and I start tweaking it. And before they even go to surgery, guess what? They start losing weight already. And after surgery, if they continue doing that stuff that I told them, they're the rock stars. They're the ones that lose the most weight. So why wouldn't it be applicable to the population? I did it myself, and I lost 10 to 15 pounds within six weeks. So, and I'm not that heavy. I am a little heavy, but these scrubs do a nice job. Of. <laughs> I'll tell you what, if you're ever worried about going out somewhere and thinking you're a little too heavy, just invest in a good pair of scrubs because it hides everything. They make great pajamas. Uh, they're awesome as work clothes. Uh, you know, I even go shopping and coach football in these, believe it or not. I'm the goofiest looking football coach, so. So why are we here? Well, I should add a couple other things. One is because you don't have anything to do from 12 to 1 rather than listen to this guy talk, which is, I'm sure there's 89 other things you could do like take a nap or go shopping or have some fun, right? Uh, but, and then maybe it's the wonderful lunch I had because it does look pretty good, okay? Uh, but, or you, you have an active interest in your weight and you want to do a better job managing it or maybe you're a little bit overweight, okay? Hypothesis number two, you are getting older. So this applies to about two-thirds of us and I'll explain that in the situation. This one, guess what? 100% of us are getting older, right? And as we get older, is it easier or is it harder to maintain your weight? Excellent, so we're at the right place. You know, I thought I was supposed to turn right instead of left. And, and this is the right place, this is the right topic. I thought I was gonna talk about hormones and stuff like that, but I'm glad, this is the right place. Okay, next, next slide, please. Aging and weight gain, and what the heck to do about it, if anything, it's a very scientific, it took me a whole night to come up with that title, okay? Uh, this is me. And you see I have a lot of letters after that, which means I can talk for a very long time. It gives me license to speak on and on and on. Less letters, you can't talk so long. These many letters, I can talk forever. 
but I'm going to I'm stay to go to one. I'm a bariatric surgeon, but what's really interesting is I like to tweak things. I like to experiment a little bit, not treat people like guinea pigs, but when you're changing diet, you're not doing anything drastically uh, different, stuff like that. But also, I've been training in this field called functional medicine. Functional medicine. There's a, a, a guy named Dr. Mark Hyman. Has anyone heard of Dr. Hyman before? He's a very popular physician. And he's a functional medicine doctor too. He went through the emergency department, or he was working in ED and did primary care for a while. And then he got really, really sick. And he saw a lot of doctors, and they gave him pills, which made him sicker. They gave him more pills, which made him sicker. And then finally, he got so frustrated, he had to find, he finally found a doctor and worked it out himself. And it turned out that he had a rare, I don't know, uh, parasitic infection from this, that, that had been going on for years. And it had so disturbed his nutrition metabolism that his nutrition was off, his hormones were off, his metabolism was off, all because of this one event years ago. So what functional medicine tries to do is instead of, and I'm not blasting the Western establishment or anything like that, we've got good doctors in this community, but many times when you go see the doctor, you get a pill or you get a treatment or you get a this or that. What functional medicine tries to do is it tries to unwind all those different things that are going on and try to be more preventative. Okay, and interestingly enough, one of the most important things in functional medicine is based on your diet. What you eat, the number one thing. And when we talk about aging and weight gain, the number one thing that you need to focus on is nutrition. We'll get to that in a little bit. So, uh, so I, it's very intriguing to me because I can do a gastric bypass, I can do a sleeve gastrectomy, a band, I can do all these operations, and to me, you know, sometimes they're a little more challenging than others, but 99.99999% of the time, I, it, it's a walk in the park. It's, a, it, it's straightforward, and patients do great. Same thing with general surgery, okay? But this stuff is really kind of mentally stimulating to me. And to watch people get well and better and lose weight and feel better and have more energy and more vitality and live longer and live healthier and put pills away, it's a fantastic feeling. Next slide. I've already gone over my talk, by the way. That's the end of the talk. Could I have any questions? No. Next slide. I have no idea. So what will you do with what you learn? Change. Will you change what you do? That's the question. So why are you here? First question anybody should ask. Why am I going to spend here an hour here? And then after this guy gets done talking, what am I going to do? Well, after that lasagna, I'm saying half of you will go home and take a nap. Okay? But um, I will tell you this. There is nothing more constant to life than change, right? But there is nothing more personally difficult than permanently changing our own behavior. Permanent change. Has anybody ever changed something about their life completely? Other than maybe got, kick that man out of the house? <laughs> if I don't have any man haters here, because you and I, we got to know where that back door is, okay? <laughs> we got to be able to run. But seriously, uh, have we ever cut out this or cut out that or started exercising regularly and stuck to it and how, how long have we done it permanently? Anybody find it easy to do? Quit smoking, for instance. That's probably one of the toughest ones, right? Mm -hmm. Tough, but some people do it. You can't do it, but it's hard. Next slide. Or we might not do anything. Might not do anything with this, but we're a little bit more informed. Okay, next slide. And I have no idea why I just did that, but I think this is gonna do it too. All right, now that y'all need a seasickness patch, <laughs> next slide. So, um, we're going to talk a little bit about obesity, weight, and what's going on with our, our um, communities, with our country, uh, with now a world for the most part. This is a, a, a I don't want to say huge or large issue because that would sound like I'm trying to make a pun, but it is. It's the number one most pressing health care issue in the United States today, weight. Uh, it, it's a big issue, and if you guys, I'm guessing, have kids, grandkids, you have uh, in-laws and outlaws, you've got people at your church and your community, all with weight issues, okay? Um, most of you, it looks like, most of you don't have any significant weight issues. It, maybe it's that 10 or 15, 20 pounds you want to lose. But I want to get a backdrop on this, because this will segue into what the treatment will be later for people who just want to lose some weight, okay? So if you look at the United States today, uh, how, what percentage of the United States is obese, meaning a BMI of greater than 30? Meaning they've got too much weight on. About one third. 
33%. One third of our population is overweight. So what percentage or what fraction of our population has a normal weight? One third. 33%. One third. Okay. Why is that? Next slide. Well, if we go back to the 1960s when I was just a twinkle in my father's eye, the obesity rate was only 15%, so it was less than half of what it currently is now. And you know, we kind of trucked on. The 1966, I was born. That's me. I'm no longer a twinkle. And as I'm getting older, here's me at five or six or seven. When I grew up, I can tell you this, my mother made breakfast. She made it. She cooked it in a pan. She didn't pour it out of a box. She cooked it in a pan, right? And after breakfast, I went to school and had one of those wonderful school lunches. But we played out on the playground, whoo, for an hour. I think now they're getting rid of gym at school, right? Okay, now they're getting rid of it. Crazy, right? What, what, what next? We need more reading and writing arithmetic so we can keep up the Chinese. Nonsense. We need to slow down as a, as a society. But anyhow, and as I got into my 10 or 12, 13 years old, oh, by the way, um, I grew up on a farm in western New York, so I was not this high flutin doctor growing up or anything like that. It was an apple farm. We were extremely poor, and uh, we were going to lose a house every year. That's all we heard for Christmas. There's no Christmas this year because we might lose a house. That's what I heard every single year, pretty much growing up. So, um, so we worked the farm as kids. We went out and worked on the farm, and when we were done working the farm, we'd come in for dinner, which was cooked in a pan. And the thing, it wasn't microwaved, it wasn't nuked, it wasn't this, it wasn't that, and it wasn't ordered. And it wasn't, I just stopped by this place or that place, and now we just don't even stop, we drive right through. So pretty soon they're going to have a guy who can throw it while you're driving. <laughs> you just roll down your window and you say, da, 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 boom, I know you. You're that 82 Buick Skylark that always orders the Whopper. The other thing is, is when, when we, when, you know, as farmers, you know, there are times when you harvest and there's times when you're busy or times when you're not. When we weren't busy, we were playing with our cousins. We were playing baseball, we were playing football, we were playing basketball. We had a basketball hoop up in a barn. It had plywood floors. Do you know how cold it is during the winter in basketball season in Buffalo, New York? Okay, we were bouncing a ball that was half flat on a plywood and we'd still play. We would still play. And I always remember, John! Yes, Mom, you need to come in for dinner. Aww, I don't want to come in. I'm playing. It's dark. You come in. We play till dark, right? Yeah. Now, you know, if I want my kids, hey, Jake, get off the Xbox. Come upstairs. <laughs> right? A little different in terms of activity. But you know what? When I grew up in Lockport, New York, I could drive through and there was a McDonald's. And then there was a Pizza Hut. And then there was a Burger King. But most of the restaurants were family owned back then. They're all family owned, family cooked meals in a pan and stuff like this, okay, not mass produced. Now you go down to Siler City where the population might be 1,500 people and there's 12 fast food restaurants and not any of them are doing poorly, are they? Okay, uh, I lived with, my, my parents were divorced when I was whatever age, seven. I went and lived with one year in Wisconsin with my father. Every small town in Wisconsin has one church and two bars. I can, you can tell a lot about a state or a community by what is in it. So when you drive down, was this Huffman Mills Road? And you get past the interstate, how many food places are there? How many are there? How many buffets are there? And how many of this and that? And on and on and on. And you know what? Do they look like they're struggling? Have you seen any go out of business? Maybe one or two, okay? But they're growing. But the population's not growing as fast. But we're becoming increasingly dependent on not just restaurant food, but fast food. And they've increased their portion sizes, increased the amount of calories and fat and all that stuff, because they know the recipe to get you, okay? They know the recipe to get you. If I sat there and made a plate of broccoli and compared that to a plate of Lay's potato chips, do you think you could eat one piece of broccoli and stop? How about one Lay's potato chip? <laughs> and what if right next to that we put a plate of Oreos? <laughs> okay, can't stop with that. Why is that? Why is that? Because there's a biochemical process that goes on in your brain. RGR Nabisco used to be RGR. They used to make cigarettes and they used to study what 
would create addictions in people. And then they try to market that. Then RGR gained Nabisco and used that same science on their food products and create food products that are addictive, that make you not want to stop putting it down. You're a human Skinner box. You're an experiment. So, what happens with the prolifer pro blah, blah, blah. <laughs> proliferation of fast food restaurants and restaurants and the increased restaurant size of meals and all the addictive foods they got there, okay, is that, and by the, fa by the way, the American dream went from, uh, let's see, a house after World War II to a house with a garage to park the car to a house with a two-car garage because you need two cars for mom and dad because mom's got to do all the running around to all these crazy sporting events and music lessons and this is and that. Okay, and then you need the two-story house with the basement, by the way, okay? And then you need the pool in the backyard, so we're all running around. Now it's a three-car garage and a three-story house, and where does it stop? So mom and dad are flying around back and forth, back and forth. So, so guess what? We've gotten away from cooking. Does anybody here cook three meals a day? Anybody? Anybody here cook two meals a day? Okay. Did my grandmother cooked for my grandfather, who's 96 now? She cooked for him three times a day. She'd make breakfast. When she was done cleaning up breakfast, she would start working on lunch. And then when lunch was done, she'd go into town and get groceries, get all the stuff she needed done, get back, start cooking dinner three times a day. So we've gotten away from cooking, haven't we? Well, we paid the price with that. We paid the price with the fast food. We paid the price with the addictive food. And we shifted our way away from foods that were, if you went to the supermarket, on the outside. On the outsides were your produce and your dairy and your meats and all those things. And we kept expanding the inside of the grocery market with rows and rows and rows of stuff you really don't need to eat. Okay, next slide. And the sad part about it is, is since the obesity rate has tripled in adults, it has tripled in kids too. So now I get 25 year old kids coming in, or teenagers coming in with type to diabetes related to obesity. We have kids in their 20s and 30s who are having strokes, kids in their 40s that are having heart attacks. If you don't think that is ha not happening right here, I can tell you it is. I can tell you it is because I see the patients here. It's everywhere USA. It's in every community. Next slide. And so that's just a slide depicting the changes between the 70s and the current time where obesity has hit 15% in kids. Okay. And on top of that, we've made them less active on top of it. But number one is nutrition, is cooking at home. Next slide. And it's not just a problem in America. Everybody wants to pick on America. Americans are fat, Americans this, Americans that. The bottom line is, is that now that we're exporting our crappy food overseas, <laughs> and they're learning how to mass produce crappy food too, okay, then the rest of the world is getting it. Number one rise in diabetics, number one increase in diabetics last year was in China. Yeah, Chinese actually, they don't, they don't put on weight very easily or, and they don't handle weight very well. So a person with a BMI of 30 who would just be overweight already having type 2 diabetes in China and India. Next slide. So, okay, so everybody's getting heavy, right? Who cares? All right. Well, anybody hear anything about health care costs in the press? Okay. <laughs> health care costs are booming. Health care costs are out of control. Let me ask you a question. What is the cost of the increased health care costs, per se? What do you think? Uh, throw out some ideas. Anybody? What, 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 what is the cause? Why, why are health care costs booming? What do you think the reasons are? I mean, the next question is that a rational human being would ask, is President Obama or government or whoever, and it's not Obama. I mean, he didn't create this, okay? But he's certainly trying to fix it. So why are health care costs soaring? Okay, is it the pharmacy companies making lots of money on their cancer drugs and targeting type 2 diabetes as a drug because $100 billion a year is spent on type 2 diabetes drugs? Yeah, sure, they're trying to make some money off you, but that's because you got type 2 diabetes. They didn't give it to you, right? Okay. Um, is it the doctors? Well, doctors haven't increased their pay scales at all in the past 20 years. How do I know? I've been a doctor for 20 years. And I get, the, I, I get paid less for Medicare now than I did five years ago. And I got paid less 10 years ago, or less five years ago than 10 years ago. And the same is true of the third party payers. Uh, Blue Cross is United, Setna's. All they do is watch to see how far Medicare can ratchet a doctor down. And they say, well, if you took it from Medicare, you'll take it from us too. 
Okay, well, we're just here to see patients. So it's not those greedy doctors, okay? When you increase obesity, 33% in the United States, one third, okay? When you double the rates of obesity over 20, 25 years, you have to realize with that comes a price, okay? If you look at this slide here, it just shows the risk of stroke deaths, meaning I died from a stroke related to BMI. Okay, this is 15 BMI, which is a runway model in New York City, okay? And this is 20, which is kind of where normal weight kind of begins. 20 to 25 is considered normal. And then over 25 is 30, which is, this is the overweight market right here. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna <laughs> give me a pointer or something. All right, so 25 to 30 right here. I'm just joking. I, I'm just picking. I, I hope we're all having fun. So, um, but the 25 to 30 mark is where you're overweight. But you can see that even from the 25 to 30, that the rate of stroke deaths goes up linearly. Goes up. See, so that's just the overweight population. That might be some of us in here. We're not just talking about obesity. Well, and then you keep going up, 30 to 35, it keeps going up. And you see who's up top, right? Uh, Alabama and Mississippi. Okay, I know Arkansas is back there, but I don't know what they do. They do something funny because they look like a little better. Alabama, Mississippi. Why is, where's North Carolina? Woo, boy. Well, that's us, ain't it? Okay, so remember when you drive down Huffman Mills Road, let that be a reminder of what's going on here, right? So, but Alabama, Mississippi, right? So, you know, a lot, yeah, a lot of states are in the south. You know why? The state fair. <laughs> okay, let me tell you something. I'm, I'm, I, if you didn't catch the beginning part of this, I'm from Buffalo, New York. We used to go to state fairs. There was saltwater taffy there, there was caramel popcorn, there was cotton candy, candied apples, all that nonsense, right? Hot dogs, hamburgers. How the hell do you fry a Twinkie? <laughs> How do you fry a oh I, they're going to have fried fries, fried fried fries or something. I don't know. They're crazy. Anyhow, anyhow. Now, you know, that's probably, that's probably uh, uh, you know, a number of different things that are going on there. Okay, so it's too hard to simplify. What I want to point out with this slide is, is we gain weight, we gain disease. Next slide. And there are about 137 different diseases associated with being overweight and obese. You don't have to be, that clearly shows that you don't have to be obese to die from a stroke. And you don't have to be obese, therefore, to have type 2 diabetes. I have people who are overweight that have type 2 diabetes. Or high blood pressure, or high cholesterol, or sleep apnea, or fatty liver disease, or depression, or anxiety, or inability to have kids because of polycystic ovary syndrome, or testosterone deficiency in males, or heart disease, or all these things. Do you hear all these that are related to obesity? One out of four people in the United States die of obesity-related diseases. One out of four. It's the leading killer. Forget about the rest, okay? One out of four, obesity-related disease. The whole point is, what did you expect? Hold on that thought. Next slide. You're going to love this. If we have sound. <laughs> you got to watch it. <laughs> All right, close your eyes. <laughs> so are you surprised then when healthcare costs are soaring? Obesity has changed from 15% rate in the 1970s to 33% and the other third are overweight. We have eaten our way into this problem and the soaring healthcare costs are all related partially I'm not saying completely, but definitely partially, to the fact that we have more disease in the United States today. We are treating more people for more problems. When $100 billion is spent last year on type 2 diabetes alone treatment, which the majority, majority, not all of it, is related indirectly or directly to overweight or obesity, then what did you think would happen to health care costs? So, next slide. All right. 
Now let's talk a little bit about weight gain and aging, which is something that I think you guys want to hear about now. On average, a male will gain weight until 55, and then they'll start to lose weight. On average, females will gain weight till 65. I'm sorry, that's the sad part about it. And then they'll start to lose the weight. Why do people lose weight later on in life? They lose muscle. They lose muscle. They lose muscle, okay? And you gain weight during the period preceding that because all along you're actually kind of losing muscle. But it, and your muscle, next slide, is going down. Your muscle is very important for burning calories. Okay? It's like the, 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 the thing that, that drives your metabolism. And as you lose muscle, boop, 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 your metabolism slows down. And if you haven't changed what you're eating, if you're maintaining the same amount of food intake, then naturally you replace the loss of muscle with a gain in fat. And that's the whole secret. That's all I found. I looked all over the place. Here's something I'll talk to you about mitochondria. We'll get a little, little, little jiggy with it. But muscle, it's a loss of muscle mass. That's very important, okay? So if your food intake hasn't changed and your activity hasn't changed, next slide, I hit it again. Like you've had a stroke or a heart attack or you've been in a car accident, you have some disability. So if, if your activity hasn't changed, your food intake hasn't changed, then, again, the average male gains weight, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide. So if you make those assumptions, with the loss of muscle, you start gaining weight because you lose your metabolic rate. So you have to change your diet. Number one thing you need to do is work on nutrition. And this is where a lot of contradictory information comes in. And this is where the only guidance I can give you is a, the fourth 1,997 patients I've talked to in my clinic over the past four years. What works and what doesn't work. Next slide. So how do you prevent loss of muscle? Hold on one second. Other than being active. <laughs> All right. Anybody know how to gain muscle back? Can you gain? Is it irreversible? Is it reversible? Strength training. There you go. Strength training. I like it. Okay. How do you do strength training? And where do you do strength training? You do it at home. You do it at home. Okay, well not everybody has a swimming pool. But I'll tell you what, those resistance bands that they have cost about 10 bucks. You can hook them up to a door, you can hook them up to your, don't hook it up to your TV. Okay, <laughs> you might find a bad issue with that. But you can hook them up anywhere and they even have directions. And if you got the internet, you can go on there and say, give me some resistant band exercises. And then you know what you gotta do? You gotta carve out a little time in the day to make it happen. A little time in the day to make it happen. Well, so, so, so what? Uh, you know, so how do you carve out a little bit of time? You just make it happen. I mean, I, I take two hours myself, a week minimum, and spend time, and you know, I've done all sorts of stuff where I've done the P90X and this is and that's and all that stuff. I just found a personal trainer myself. I found a personal trainer, you know why? Because in the hour I work out with him, he gets four hours out of me. I've never been worked like a dog like that in my life. Now, I'm not recommending that to anybody or anything, but that's my own personal thing. And I did my workout today at 6 to 7 in the morning. And I have a 10-hour, 11-hour work day, okay? And then I'll go home. And on Saturdays, it's 7 to 8 in the morning. So if I can do it two hours a week, find two hours out. If I can carve two hours out of me, do you guys think you could carve two hours out of your week? to do some resistance trainings, either with bands or a two pound weight or this and that, okay? And always get information and always make sure from your doctor that you're okay doing some exercise before you start on a program because I don't want you having some bad event like a heart attack or something because your heart's bad before you start doing it, okay? So just make sure you're okay doing it. There's another reason muscle is important. Anybody know of a person who's had a hip fracture? Okay. What do you think the mortality rate is in a hip fracture patient in a patient over the age of 70? It's almost 50%. Why, is the hip fracture that bad? No, it's not that bad. Actually, they do a surgery in about 45 minutes. My mother fractured her hip. She was up and around the next day with a trainer, okay? But muscle 
is where the energy comes to help you heal. Muscle is also where the energy comes, the protein comes, to help your immune system function and to fight off infection. The number one killer in people that have had hip fractures that are over the age of 70 is pneumonia. It's pneumonia, it's not the hip fracture itself. It's the fact that you're immobile for a short period of time, a little bug that you might have coughed out 30 years ago or 20 years ago when you had a better immune system, when you had this muscle still around. Well, guess what? You can't fight it because the insult of the hip fracture has put stress on your body and your body can't respond to the stress because it doesn't have muscle. So what do we need to do to create muscle? Well, yes, you can work out, but if you're not eating the right things, like protein, then you got nothing for muscle to be built off because muscle is made of protein. Next slide, keep going. Anyhow, there's other things you can do. Personal trainer, resistance training we talked about, or weights, yoga, swimming, all sorts of things. Have fun with it. Have fun with it, enjoy it. This is like putting money into the health bank for you. Okay, money into the health bank. It's very important to have muscle for your immune system and so that you can tolerate injury and you can recover faster. I operate on patients that are older. Sometimes I'll put them on a preoperative high protein diet for a good month and a half before I operate on them. And you know what? They consistently recover quicker, or more quickly after an elective surgery because they have more muscle mass available and their nutrition is better than the stuff they, that they were eating. Okay, don't worry about the last one. Next slide. This is a mitochondria. This is the next part of the talk. Mitochondria and aging. Mitochondria, has anybody heard of a mitochondria before? Great, we got a good audience out here. Okay, so it's a powerhouse of a cell. We have about a thousand of these in every cell in our body. Anybody care to guess how many cells we have in our body? <laughs> 50 trillion, 50 trillion. There's this researcher in Oslo, Norway, who like count, no, I, I have no idea how they came up with that number, but that was an estimate, 50 million. He did not count them. So 50 million times 1,000 is 50,000 trillion. That's almost as much as the national debt, okay? <laughs> how much we owe China is another way we could call that, right? All right, so. Anyhow, the mitochondria is very, very important because it generates energy. Anybody here feel tired or fatigued? Not have a lot of energy? Okay, well, there's a number of reasons why I do it. Well, one of the reasons why we might not have enough energy is maybe we're just not doing a good job taking care of mitochondria because mitochondria um, can die off before you die off. You lose the mitochondria over time, and that's one very important theory established in the 1970s of why people age. And people who do a better job of taking care of their mitochondria may actually slow the process of aging. And not only that, okay, and improve their metabolism, not only that, but there's research coming out now where people are actually creating new mitochondria in cells. They're actually finding things to create new mitochondria. What does that mean? Could you possibly halt aging? Could you possibly reverse aging? This is very interesting. Very interesting stuff. What is, what are mitochondria, well first thing mitochondria need, okay, is a good substrate. That's nutrition. That's what you're putting in your mouth and it's not just calories. It's the quality of the nutrition you're eating. If you're not feeding it well, and by the way, if you're not taking or if you don't have the right vitamins, minerals, cofactors for the mitochondria to do its job, then you're not going to do a good job of creating energy, okay? You may have further problems. The um, mitochondria, well, let me ask you this. How many people here take a multivitamin daily? Very conscientious group. How many, how many people under the age of 40, do you think, take a multivitamin daily? Or how many of you, under the age, when you're under the age of 40, took a multivitamin daily? See, as we get older, we realize, hey, man, <coughs> We gotta start taking care of ourselves, right? So we start taking a multivitamin, even some more stuff. We get more health conscious, right? Because we realize that as our parents move on to the next world and whatnot, that we're not mortal either. And we need to do a better job of taking care of ourselves. So, okay, so good. That's a good start, multivitamins, okay? Uh, because they have vitamins and minerals and, and different cofactors uh, that help mitochondria 
pres uh, preserve mitochondrial function. So the mitochondria, though, is its own worst enemy. As it creates energy, it uses the oxygen molecule. And that's why oxygen is so important to us. We live on what we call aerobic metabolism. The oxygen help us create a, a, a product called ATP. ATP is the energy of life. It's the energy of our lives, ATP. So we use oxygen. At the end, the oxygen is kind of twisted up and torqued, and it needs to go in a trash bucket. Okay? It's called a free radical. Okay? Free radical oxygen species. It's a little bit charged. It's not quite normal. And it needs to be taken care of by a free radical scavenger. Anybody here of antioxidants? Okay, well, that's what antioxidants do. They're sitting there at the end of the line, okay, and they're waiting for this free radical to get down, and they're there to catch it. Because if they don't catch it, that oxygen, free radical species, theoretically, can actually damage the actual cell that built it, the powerhouse cell. They can damage the mitochondria, which in turn can damage the cell, which in turn damage the tissue. And when you lose mitochondria, and you lose cells, and your tissues become more dysfunctional, that is a process called aging. And you go to your doctor's office, um, usually the prescription that you get is what? If, uh, I can tell you ubiquitously in our patients, it's Eat less, exercise more, okay? And a year later, those patients come back, and guess what? They're the same weight. And if anybody studied Albert Einstein, he told you the definition of insanity is trying the same thing twice and expecting a different result, okay? So, so clearly, that's not the right thing, but these guys don't have necessarily the time to sit there in 45, 50, 60 minutes with you and outline a plan to get your, your weight loss, okay? Um, Diet pills, uh, yeah, not so much. Uh, about 10% weight loss and then of your body, and then once you're off the pills, what happens? You gain, gain it twice. back. And then surgery, who wants surgery, for God's sakes? But that's kind of a last-ditch effort. If you can't lose your weight and you've got some serious medical issues like type 2 diabetes, high <coughs> blood pressure, high cholesterol, you may consider surgery. It's very effective in getting rid of those other problems, and it's a lot safer than it used to be. Next slide. So dieting 101. Don't do it yourself unless, next slide, uh, the self-diet. It's like being in the middle of ocean in a robot without oars, okay? There's so much conflicting information that if I didn't know what I knew today and I went on the internet, I, I got the cranberry diet, I got the this, Dr. Oz says green coffee extract is phenomenal, but the, what about the raspberry ketones? Are the raspberry ketones better than the green coffee? What if I combine both? What if I space them out together? Woo, that's a thought right there, right? And then Tony Horton comes in with his gazelle and says, look at all my lean, beautiful people on these gazelles. You gotta have a Thompson gazelle to run in your, your living room while you're eating your raspberry ketones and green coffee extract. So you get one of those, right? And all it does is it allows you to hang last year's clothes on it because that's all that we do with our exercise equipment. In fact, or they end up at a yard sale, which is a great place to buy exercise equipment because they ditch it and go back and all that stuff. Go back. Okay, so, so it, it, what happens is what, it, what happens with people with serious, really long term, complicated medical issues in healthcare, you end up getting frustrated. You end up yo yoing. You lose weight, gain it back, lose weight, gain it back, lose the weight. And that's why they call it a diet because you end up dying doing it. Okay? <laughs> Next slide. Um, commercial diets. Anybody know Jennifer Hudson? Yeah, a very beautiful girl, um, lost a lot of weight and did the Weight Watchers. Anybody do Weight Watchers here? Awesome. My grandmother did Weight Watchers. I remember the little grapefruit sodas that they used to have in the fridge. The 1970s Weight Watchers been around, okay? If it worked for everybody or a whole lot of anybody or anybody, they'd be a lot more successful. Did it work? And here's the key. Did you keep it off? Did you keep the weight off? Because a lot of people will lose the weight and gain the weight back. In fact, the majority, if you look at uh, Weight Watchers Atkins Zone Diet, Journal of American Medical Association did a study, 12-month study, and they found that the average weight loss with any of those forms was 7 pounds with the 50% dropout rate. Now, that Weight Watchers didn't come out and discuss that. They didn't advertise it or anything like that. But on New Year's Eve, I can tell you, when you're going to make that uh, big commitment to your new diet the next day, um, you'll see a hundred different advertisements by her on there. I, I'm sure she's got a personal trainer and personal chef, and that's why she looks so fine. Don't forget, she's getting paid to look this way, as are models this and that. So, next slide. And then we talked about weight loss pills and supplements. 
Um, again, most of the pills that are prescription get about 10% of your body weight, and then as soon as you get off the pill, it gains back. Uh, there was Fen Fen that was on the market uh, 10, 20 years ago. A lot of people uh, died or had heart attacks from that. Okay, not a good thing. In fact, you can take prescription pills like uh, some of the diabetes meds uh, that were pushed out in the past two decades that had a high stroke and heart attack rate and you yanked from the market. So, you know, pills aren't always the right answer. Next slide. And then, of course, you've got every single advertisement. Listen, weight loss is a major industry right now, okay? I'm a bariatric surgeon. I do what it works. I give the person a second shot. I blow it because they decide they want to change up their diet and do something different. That's on them. But I'm at least going to give them a chance because most of the people I see are 350, 300 pounds and have 18 different medical issues, a whole list of problems, something like that. And you know what? A little bit of pills, a little bit of dieting and exercise, it's going to be real hard for those people to come back. Sometimes your weight is at such a point that surgery is the best answer for you, okay? But you see a thousand articles like this, right, every day. My other grandmother used to get the Inquirer. Anybody get the National Enquirer with Bat Boy and all those interesting characters? Yeah. But there's a ton of these diet ads. Don't buy into it. Don't buy into the hype. It doesn't work, okay? 99.99% doesn't work. Next slide. So what does work? First, you gotta respect that you are an individual and what works for you might not work for someone else, okay? And then you want a strategy that, it, it, you know, when you get older, that you wanna increase the amount of muscle. Why do you wanna increase the amount of muscle? Because it gives you energy. Because it increases your metabolic rate, that's right. It increases your metabolic rate and, and, and it does give you energy and what it does is it helps burn calories. So instead of adding on fat, you're burning calories, right? And does it take, uh, is, it gonna, is there gonna be a difference in a week or two weeks? No, is it gonna be three weeks or six weeks? Maybe not so much. How about 12 weeks to 16 weeks? Yeah, that's when you'll notice things are different, that you're feeling better, and your clothes are fitting looser. And that's the key. You're not necessarily going to lose weight, but all of a sudden you're gonna go from a size 12 to a size 10. And you go, oh, that's interesting. But my weight's the same. You're looking at the scale for 12 weeks, getting frustrated. Stop that. Don't do that. Just look at your clothes size. For guys, they just look at the number of notches in their belt. I've done that for 15 years. Uh, during medical school and residency, woo, went out. Now it's, woo, it's coming back in. So, but not without effort. So if you can get activity and, and exercise, you do as much as you can, the resistance, okay? But there's something that's more important than exercise. What is that? And then take care of your mitochondria. Um, so, and, and when we talk, so, so that, that sort of exercise is probably pretty easy to do at home, right? And you can do it regularly and everything like that. So you want to create it sustainable. You want to make your, and guys, if you need to leave, just go ahead and step up and leave. You want to make it a long-term deal. You want to make it a live it, right? You want to think, this is what it's going to be. It's going to be a live it, not a diet, all right? Now, the following information has been distilled through the years that I've dealt with weight loss patients, and this is what works. I don't have a pill to sell you. I don't have surgery to sell you. I'm out of here. I'm out here because I just like talking to people and helping them with their health. And that'll cost you $25. No, just <laughs> next slide. Okay. Nutrition is king. Everybody say that. Nutrition is king. Or if it's in my house, nutrition is queen. You say that one. Nutrition is queen. Yeah, because the queen rules the roost. Everybody knows that, right? So nutrition is king. Exercise and being active is number two. And it's not even a close number two, but it's a number two. But you got to get it. Especially as you get older, you got to get the exercise. That's a key feature. If, if muscle loss and mitochondrial issues are the chief components of it, then. But that said, if I looked at all your nutrition today, and I did, what would I do, a seven-day diet history. That's what the first thing I do when people walk in my clinic. In a month, you come back, you write down everything you eat and drink for seven days. I look at it, I, I usually go, nope, 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 oh, broccoli, I like that. Nope, 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 oh yeah, and you got that, right? And sometimes people are very surprised that string cheese isn't on my top ten list, okay? Because it's, it's string cheese light, doctor. Or that Yo Play Light isn't on my top 10 list because it has tons of high fructose corn syrup, which is a metabolic uncoupler, okay? That there's a lot of different things. Um, but I'll tell you what, the generation, you know, I'm telling you, the 20 to 40, 45 crowd, okay, some of these people don't even cook at home. They eat everything out of a box. They don't even cook. And some people don't even eat at home. They eat almost every meal 
at a fast food place or a restaurant. That's what I see. That's what we're up against. That's what we have to change. So, uh, nutrition is king. Exercise. Why well, you just want to get done with this, don't you, Donna? So, and exercise, sleep is an important thing. If you have poor quality sleep, how do you know if you have poor quality sleep? Ask yourself these questions. Number one, do I wake up in the middle of the night? Anybody wake up in the middle of the night? Okay. And does anybody wake up more than once? Okay. Does anybody wake up more than twice? I'm hearing a lot of mm-hmm's. Okay, question number two, all right? How would you personally rate the quality of your sleep? One to ten, throw out some numbers. Ten, I sleep like a baby. One, I do sleep very poorly. Go ahead and throw it out there. Once, lots of ones and bad stuff, right? Number three, this is the most important question you have to ask. Sleep is a restorative function. Its job is to actually, it's a very active process, but while you're asleep, it restores your body for the next day. So when you wake up, you get that little cell phone thing, right? And you wake up in the morning and your cell phone's fully charged, right? If it's plugged in, right? You plug it in by your bedside, that's what I do. I have to, I'm a doctor, I'm on call. Might be an important call. Do you feel fully recharged the next morning? 10, or do you feel not charged at all, number one? All right, well, for those of you that aren't, aren't above a seven, if you're seven, eight, nine, you're probably pretty good with those questions. You're probably okay, probably don't need to go any further. But if you're six, five, and certainly heading down toward one, then you probably want to ask your doctor about a sleep evaluation with a, with a sleep doctor, okay? Because sometimes it's, I can't go to sleep. Some of you have more significant question, uh, issues like sleep apnea or leg movement disorders where your legs are flopping around like a fish while you're sleeping, okay? So there's a, a bunch of different things, but you probably want to get tested. Why? Because these three things, if you can clean up these three things, you know that weight gain and aging issue you're having, you could probably reverse it. You could probably get it better if you just do these three things right here, okay? Optimal hormone balance is tough. I mean, there's a lot of negative press about estrogen replacement and stuff like that, and what do you do with progesterone and all that stuff, but there's things called bioidentical hormones out there in replacement that you may or may not want to check into, and you got to find a person that, that's good at doing it, and you probably want to talk to one or two referrals from that side that source. Uh, for men, it's easy because men, after 20, 25, after the bull, uh, testosterone goes, boo, starts dripping down. Then they become the old bull in the pasture. You know, the one that you don't do anything but look at, wave at it as you drive by, right? <laughs> right? That's me. I'm 47. So I'm the old bull in the pasture, right? But uh, testosterone deficiency and problems, if your husband has it, can be a serious problem. It can actually lead to increased heart problems. And it also puts, they did a study in Europe whereby they took about a thousand people and put them on testosterone replacement to get them back to normal, and a thousand they didn't. And the people that they put on replacement lost six inches on their waist and 33 pounds over five years on average. Um, the, and with no higher risk of prostate cancer, which was very interesting. So, hormones can be important, but that's a number four. And then five, stress. My gosh, stress, 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 stress. We gotta do this, that, we gotta be here, this, that, and all that stuff. Get rid of it. If you don't need it, dump it. Okay? And, and if you're looking to gain or bring on something, think long and hard about it. Take stress off of your plate, because stress is a killer. It's a cardiovascular killer, and increased stress hormone, cortisol, puts weight around here. So, but these are the three top things. Next slide. Nutrition. All right, nutrition is queen, right? I gotta say queen, I gotta change this topic, because there's not another man in here except him. All right. So let's talk about nutrition, right? What I want you to do, wake up in the morning, within one hour, eat. Okay, everybody write that down? Within one hour, eat, okay? I know you ladies love protein. Nah, that's, uh, that's facetious. What do I eat for breakfast, Dr. Bruce? Well, what do I eat for breakfast, you ready? Okay, first thing is I got one of those high-fangled, expensive blenders, but you don't need an expensive blender to do it. It's a Vegetech, Mitotech, uh, I don't know, what's, what's it called? Blenders. Blenderizer, what? Vitamix. Blendtec, Vitamix, yeah, so you get those Vitamix, right? So what I do is I take some ice, water, I put a banana, and I take a handful of baby spinach, believe it or not, which blended up, tastes pretty doggone fresh and good. Uh, ice, water, half a cup of baby spinach, sounds horrible, right? A banana, and then I take an avocado, I cut it in half, scoop it out, and stick it in there. So now I have a healthy fat, which actually creams it up nicely, I've got a vegetable, I've got a fruit, and the last thing I add to it is protein powder. 
Protein, you gotta have some protein with every meal. Uh, you want to have protein. Remember, protein is the building block of muscle, right? So if you don't get protein, like the lasagna, I would say that in the, in the garlic bread, you got about 80, 90% carbs. You got about this much carbs, you got this much protein. You don't need that much carbs and this much protein. You need this much protein, this much carbs, okay? All right, and then you wanna wait till lunchtime, right? And then when you have your next plate, you want protein, okay? Lean protein, and give me examples of lean protein. Chicken, Chicken and fish. Chicken and any seafood, any seafood. So shellfish, oysters, this, that's all that tuna. I got that lemon pepper tuna in a foil packet. That sounds pretty good, right? Beans. Beans. Well, peanut butter. Peanut butter's okay, but it's been doctored up quite a bit, and it's got a lot of sugar in it. So if you ate it on a piece of celery, I'd feel better. If you ate it on a cracker, I'd want to shoot you like Old Yeller. <laughs> okay, so I do tell that to my patients once in a while, and they come and they gain weight. I, I'm gonna take you out back to that corn crib, and shoot you like my old dog, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I'd feel better about it, but still, and it does have protein in it, so it's not horrible. But what you want to do is move away from eating processed foods to eating whole, clean, fresh foods. Okay. Oh, nuts. Nuts. Okay, nuts, un unroasted, unsalted, raw nuts, almonds. Um, also, uh, turkey. They have the most amazing turkey breast in the cafeteria. Okay, Mr. Kern, that's a pitch for the cafeteria. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's on Tuesdays at lunch. Amazing turkey breast. So turkey, okay. Um, there's some dairy sources of protein, such as cottage cheese. I know everybody hates that, but I'm gonna tell you, when you add a little farmer's honey to it, and a little bit of cinnamon or nutmeg, and mix in some of those raw nuts, and a little bit of raw fruit, it's delish. It's delish. If you eat yogurt, don't get the Yoplait doctored up yogurt, just get plain yogurt. Better yet, plain Greek yogurt. It's usually a little bit better quality, okay? And then do the same thing. Add a little bit of honey, a little bit of local honey, and then add some cinnamon, nutmeg, all that different stuff like that. That can be a great breakfast with protein, okay? The cottage cheese or the yogurt. All right, so, so those are all different sorts of protein. So at lunch and dinner and breakfast, you're gonna have protein, right? Because there's no sense in doing all those resistance band exercises if your muscle has no way to build it, okay? And then take your multivitamins, right? So you've got some vitamins, minerals for it. All right, next thing is vegetables, except for the white potato. Not a big fan of the white potato. Starchy, a lot of carbs, stuff like that. If you could avoid those or limit those, I'd be okay. But vegetables, you steam them, you saute them in olive oil, and you put salt and spices on them in a pan, takes like two seconds. Your green beans and this and that and all that stuff. So protein and vegetables, okay? And then if you got a little room left over, you know what you have? Some fruit, fresh fruit. Not processed fruit, not canned fruit and syrups, not all that stuff, just fresh fruit. You have a white peach. There's some amazing white peaches out from somewhere mm -hmm. lately. I get white peaches, okay? Uh, there's, uh, everything's in season right now. A lot of things are in season. Strawberries, blackberries, raspberries, all those things. You know what? The darker the berry, the darker the, darker the berry, the darker the fruit. You know how, what, what it is rich in, typically? Antioxidants. So you can get, you can let medicine be thy food. Hippocrates, okay, sounds goofy. Or let food be that medicine. I messed that up. What was Hippocrates thinking? So yes, antioxidants, same thing with the spinach and all that stuff. And by the way, do you know spinach is rich in protein? Mm -hmm. Yeah, spinach is, but the iceberg salad that you had, well, it doesn't have a whole lot of anything in it. Okay, but you throw some kale in there, some baby greens or this or that, now we're talking, right? All right, so, all right. Um, and then eat like that three times a day. Do that for three weeks, maybe four weeks, okay? Prepare your foods, okay? You can go to, I, I don't know if they have a Boston market here, but you can go to places where they got a baked chicken and two veggies on the side. So it doesn't mean you don't have to go to a restaurant. Just don't get the special sauce or all the other things that they, they're gonna throw on top of it and certainly don't get dessert, okay? Desserts? Now, okay, so that's, that's what you're gonna eat three times a day, okay? If you need a snack, Try some dark chocolate with nuts. Or take a red grape and put it with a, pair it with a walnut and see what you get there. Boom, flavor burst, right? Whole fresh foods, okay? Have a nice healthy snack, okay? What don't you eat? Dessert, you ready? You ready for the no-goes? Okay, if you do this, if you do what I say for four weeks, you'll notice a drop in weight, an improvement in your blood pressure, 
an improvement in your energy, and a different taste for food. And if you eat fast food, potato chips, Chips Ahoy, these things like that, after about six weeks of doing this, you lose your taste, you lose your craving, because you've lost the addictive tendency. You're gone from it, okay? So what do you avoid, you ready? You've been pretty good back there. What do you, absolutely not. Off Dr. Bruce's list. Well, sodas. Sodas. No, sodas. Potatoes, white. White potatoes. Process, any white bread, white rice, white potatoes. Flour. White flour or flour. Include wheat with that. You didn't stand with salt. No salt. bread. Salt. I'm okay with salt for non hypertensives. Oh. Yeah. Is that you? Sugar. Nope. Sugar is gone. I can be your sugar. <laughs> <laughs> They're inflammatory, and that's a very that's a whole other talk. That's two oh one. So all right, so sugar, rice. Rice. Rice has very little nutritive value. The reason rice has flourished, if you look at the locations that flourished, because it's a cheap, easily raisable source of food, even in very wet climates, that fills the stomach. What? Brown and rice? Brown. I'm okay with brown rice. And I'm okay with the sweet potatoes. In fact, I love sweet potatoes. There you go. There you go. That said, I'm very much a meat and a vegetable sort of guy. A meat and a vegetable, a lean meat. Again, not the red juicy steak stuff like that. If you want to have that once in a while, I'm not out here to turn you into a saint. I'm just trying to teach you what works, okay? But the meats, lean proteins, the vegetables, and a little bit of fruit, nuts, seeds, healthy olive oil for cooking, olive oil for salads. Balsamic vinegar with the olive oil makes a nice dressing if you had garlic or pepper, salt, things like that, it can blend that up and make that nice and shake it and season it and all that good stuff. Did someone have a question? I did. Yes, ma'am. You said dark chocolate. Yeah, 70% chocolate. or greater, cocoa. COCOA is the actual ingredient that makes chocolate, and then they add a whole bunch of stuff to it. So when you look at a percentage, you want 70% or greater cocoa. It actually has a, in some, in some studies, a neurocognitive benefit means it helps your brain stay cool. And, and, and that, this diet that we talked about, is it not anti-inflammatory? And what is Alzheimer's and Parkinson's? It's an end-stage inflammatory disease. What is aging? It is an inflammatory disease. It's a disease of inflammation. So you want to reduce your risk of those things? Okay. Then clean up your diet. Remember, nutrition is queen, right? So uh, I think we got a lot of the no's there. No fast food. No fried food, unless you're going to saute in a little olive oil with a little something, all right? No fast food, no fried food, no junk food, okay? If you're going to drink something, water is your primary beverage, okay? If you just get rid of the beverages alone and drink water, you probably lose two to three pounds in one to two weeks. In my younger patients, they lose five to ten pounds because they're all Mountain Dew addicts. <laughs> they really are. I mean, Mountain Dew is one of the most addictive foods. Diet Mountain Dew is more addictive than Mountain Dew. I see people that drink ten cans of that stuff a day. All right. All right. Next. So, and then we talked about the sleep and exercise and all those different things. And yeah, next slide. And then supplements. All right. Supplements. What supplements should or should you not be taking? A lot of argument, a lot of debate. But we talked about inflammation, didn't we? Inflammation causing aging. Well, there's some natural anti. First thing is you can get a lot of stuff if you eat a clean diet. The problem is most people don't eat a good clean diet, so when you don't put it in, your body can't extract it. What are the things that I see common? Uh, probably one in, what, one in five patients, one in five patients, 20% of, uh, of y'all have B12 deficiency, okay? All right, neurocognitive problems with that. You start getting fuzzy, you're not as clear, stuff like that. B12 deficiency, folate deficiency, which increases homocysteine levels and causes problems with heart disease, all right? Vitamin D, probably one third to one half of you are vitamin D deficient, should be on vitamin D tomorrow. Short term, you know, you see the little kids with the, the rickets and everything like that, but, uh, and then there's the osteoporosis things that we dealt with, because you've probably been vitamin D deficient since a kid, so you never laid down good bone in the beginning. Drink all the milk you want, doesn't matter, you weren't getting the vitamin D you needed. Long term, cancer. Vitamin D is very important for immune surveillance and fighting off viruses during the winter. Do you know why people get colds and flu during the winter? 
because your vitamin D levels go down because you store up all your vitamin D during the summer in the summer months, in the sunny months, and you get it through the skin, and during the winter, your vitamin D levels drop, and that makes you susceptible to colds and flus. So vitamin D is very important for immune surveillance. Long-term, cancers. Cancers occur with increased vitamin D deficiency. So, um, so vitamin D3, D3 is the active form, vitamin D, uh, is one thing I'd recommend. Fish oil, and it also very potent anti-inflammation, so reduces or helps slow aging. Uh, very cheap, affordable, all that good stuff. Fish oil, another thing. 1.4 grams of EPA, just write that down. 1.4 grams of EPA, okay? I'm using a dose there, you can make it 1.5, you can make it one, you could take two, you could take two and a half, it's really not that dangerous. Fish oil, anti-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory. So reduces, helps reduce a lot of different things. Are you gonna feel different on these things? Nah, not really. Will you reduce your risk of developing something serious further on down the road? Yeah, well something happens, sooner or later it happens to all of us, right? But you're just risk mitigating, all right? Coenzyme Q10, it is the bucket at the end of that chocolate factory line, okay? Remember all those little free rock, uh, uh, chocolates that were getting away and causing damage to the mitochondria in the I Love Lucy video that caused damage? Coenzyme Q10 actually catches those things and it actually is what the free radical will go to in the end if it's in right amounts. But most people, or a large amount of people, don't have enough coenzyme Q10 in their blood. And you can get specialized testing for this. It's very expensive. But if you want to find out, we can CoQ10 less so you can find it out. But anyhow, CoQ10 is something that I recommend taking probably about 200 milligrams a day. Okay, vitamin D3, uh, anywhere from two to 5,000 units a day. Um, when you take folate, take the L form of folate, L-methylfolate. We have some at our store. I'm not trying to pitch the store, though, but take the levo form of folate. It's the active form of folate, not the other one, okay? And then curcumin, that's one you should look up and read a little bit about. Curcumin is actually uh, found in turmeric. Turmeric? Do you know that in the Indian, in the sub-Asia, Southeast Asia continent, the Indian Indians, you know the ones? Um, <coughs> What was I going to say? The, yeah, the curry and all those foods and stuff like that, that, that type of Indian food, right? Um, curry is actually very yellow, isn't it? Okay, well, it, it gets its color from curcumin. Curcumin is actually the part, it's about 5% of the turmeric plant. Do you know that in that uh, population, there's a very exceedingly low rate of Alzheimer's and dementia long term? And what they found is, is that this curcumin actually shuts it down inflammation similar to steroids, but without all the side effects. So long term, it, um, you can find that at um, the vitamin shop, per se. You can go there and you can ask about it, you can read about it. So write that down and um, think about taking that daily, especially as we get older. Uh, a good anti-inflammatory environment is very important. But again, the first important thing about getting better and losing weight is what? Nutrition. Nutrition is queen, okay? So we're all going to... What would you, what amount of cumin would you take? What do I take? I think I take, I think I take 100 to 200 milligrams a day of curcumin. But if you check with Donna uh, in a week or even tomorrow, if she gives you her, her home number or whatever she gives you, uh, I can get back to you. But I take it daily. These are things, by the way, I take and do daily. I don't walk the walk I th or talk the talk. I walk the walk too, okay? I exercise. I eat clean. I do all these things. Um, probably have one too many glasses of wine from time to time, but, um, all right, next slide. Is there substitute fish oil if you can't do Yes, there's krill oil, um, there's a, the flax seed. Flaxseed, yeah, but I think, I, as far as flax, what I would do is go to the vitamin shop, which is right over here around the corner at the, 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 the do, 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 do. It, it's Alman's Crossing, right? And uh, ask them about omega-3 oils and whatnot. So there are two different types of fatty acids that in particular omega-3s and omega-6s. Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory in nature for the most part. And they create an anti-inflammatory environment in our body. Omega-6s can be very inflammatory. There are some omega-6s, though, that I, I do occur, think occur in flaxseed oil that are actually good for you. So, uh, again, you want to look for good omega-3s and good omega-6s. And if you went there, they could probably uh, recommend that. But I definitely would take that daily. Um, oh, by the way, brush and floss daily. 
Make sure you floss daily. Uh, flossing is related to cardiovascular disease because of inflammation. When you get gingivitis chronically, you get a higher rate of cardiovascular disease. All right, so um, that is my talk. I guess the question I have to ask you is, is are, are you going to make a change? And, how are you, and, and are you going to stick with it? Okay, stick with it for four weeks. Take my, I guess it's, I'm making this stuff up now. My four week Dr. Bruce challenge. Work on nutrition, work on getting those exercise things going, and then ask yourself, remember how you are right now, remember in four weeks, okay, in four weeks ask, ask yourself if you're feeling better. The last thing is, is if you got a sleep problem and you know who you are because you know the questions, ask your doctor about getting a sleep test and or seeing a sleep doctor and follow it through till you're getting good sleep. Don't just stop because you got the wrong answer here, the wrong answer there. Follow you get, if you fix your nutrition, your exercise, and your sleep, you're going to feel better in how long? No, 12 weeks. 12 weeks. But you will lose weight in four weeks. You will lose weight. And remember, it's a livid. Don't change anything that you're not able to sustain. Carve it out, create it, make it a real part of your life that you can sustain long term. Okay? Yeah.